Um, so thank you, uh, thanks for letting me come here. Um, first, I apologize. I got a lot of material for 20 minutes. Um, I'm gonna probably go pretty fast. I'm gonna try to be accessible to being very nerdy and also being accessible so that if you don't know this, hopefully you'll still get something out of it. Um, a quick about me, um, I work at Ar Armstrong World Industries. I'm the tech lead for their website. I've been doing this for, I've actually been on the web team there for the last 25 years uh, at the same company, NIT, doing web stuff. It's kind of freaky. Um, so that's the quick about me. Um, so if you get anything, basically here's the whole talk. What's new in HTTP3? Uh, the quick transport protocol. Uh, so it's QUIC. I believe it's uh, pronounced quick. If I didn't, well, I'm just going to say it that way for the rest of the talk. Um, the next up is TLS all the things. TLS meaning SSL. Everything's secure by default. Uh, next thing is QPAC. It's a replacement for HPAC. If you don't know what HPAC is, I'll explain it a little later and improve server push. Um, yeah, it is what it is. So what is quick? This is gonna be a super quick overview of quick. I'm gonna, no pun intended. Um, then we'll talk about it a, a little more later. But it's pronounced quick. It's, a, it's an attempt to do the TCP protocol, but you're doing it over UDP. So if you remember hearing TCP IP, so IP, everything goes on that. TCP is one protocol, UDP is another protocol, and that's all the more in-depth I'm going to go uh, at the moment. What we're going to do next is jump back in time. So why are we going to jump back in time? Well, to learn why HTTP 3 is going to be good, we need to find out what 1 and 1 and, and 2 were doing. So what is HTTP? Whew. It's a lot of different protocols at the same time. This, this slide here doesn't even encompass all of the RFCs that make it all up. Um, so you have, and actually the craziest thing, um, so I wrote this talk actually about three years or three or so years ago, just never gave it. Um, and then when I came back to it uh, on the Tomcat users list, I belong to that folk, those folks over there, uh, we saw an update and it's like, wow, June, like this June of 2022, they just released new editions of everything. So of semantics, of caching, of HTTP 1.1, of 2, and then 3 actually in, in, in official form. There's also a couple other companion RCs like HTTP state management. Um, that actually dates back to 2011. Uh, HTTP state management, a fancy word for cookies. So cookies are just a crazy thing. So I've been doing this for 25 years. I remember when cookies first came out. and I still do things on the 2001 version of cookies, and I keep on forgetting that 2011 fixed so many of those problems. There's also another one here I called out, 3896, all about URIs. The reason I posted an obsolete one is because it was replaced by three other ones, and that, that doesn't even encompass everything that involves HTTP. So if you get really bored one day, start reading these. Um, really, they're really awesome to read, but they, they, they can put you to sleep. So let's, uh, let's dive back to HTTP 1.1. It's got a lot of additions to it. Um, just gonna show you, like, it has been revised over time. So even though it's 1.1, it actually has a couple different additions to it, a couple different versions. Why are there a couple different versions? Because over time, back in 1997, when we decided we're gonna come up with 1.1, it started working one way. And all of, so, does everyone know what an RFC is, a request for comment? So a request for comment, I'm just gonna you know, beat this to death. A request for comment is uh, a company or a person or a little bit of combination of both, a group, a consortium says, we have this technology, here's how it works. And here's how we think it works. And so if everyone wants to use this technology, this interoperability, here's the description. And of course, every description is gonna be wrong over time, so it gets, it gets uh, rewrites, um, and not rewrites, but more, more like clarifications. That's what all these uh, future editions do. So as we talk about 1.0, 1.1, uh, 2.0, and 3.0, um, here's a quick overview of all their differences. And we're gonna go a little more in depth into all of these. So 1.0, you know, back in 1996, 10, and there's actually a .09, but that never made an RFC. 1.0 was nice because it was finding a standard, but it was horrible because it didn't do a lot of things. But at least everyone was talking on the same page and not you know, doing crazy stuff back in 1996. 1997, the best thing they did was they split 
the semantics and syntax. What is semantics and syntax? Semantics is, okay, so here's, we're gonna say stuff and here's how we're gonna define what it means. And then the syntax is, how are we gonna say it? Is it this colon equals stuff? And what happens with the character turns, the line feeds, the character encodings and all that kind of stuff, all that definition in, in the syntax. Um, then when you get to HTT so HTTP 1.1, it also gave us host headers, virtual hosting. Uh, I mean, HTTP 1.1, still absolutely beautiful to use today. In fact, it gives us the keep alive header, so some of the performance issues, not too bad. But for people like Google, Facebooks, and all that kinds of stuff, they need more performance, because there's defects. So that's where HTTP 2 came into play. HTTP 2, HTTP 2 gave us things like um, let me take a step back. HTTP2, in a quick summary, is more network oriented. So let's optimize going back and forth. So the semantics, the syntax, so how the client and the server talk to the web browser, the web server talk to one another, essentially the same in 1.1 and 1.2. How they say it at a network binary protocol uh, kind of changed. Not drastic, but big enough to make a version change. Then when you get to HTTP2 to HTTP3, everything's out. So everything before was TCP related, now we're UDP related. So totally different protocol, and we'll talk a little more about QUIC as we go along, but I'm really fascinated by what you can do with QUIC in the future. Um, this could own, so QUIC is actually a fairly generic protocol that HTTP is, happens to be the first uh, big thing really using it. So let's rewind again, back to HTTP 1.1. So a sample request is gonna look like get, so you'll see get, post, put, delete, um, and then you'll see what do you want, uh, and it'll always be a path, and then, H, and then the version, and then you'll get a couple headers, and that's a normal request. So between HTTP 1, 2, and 3, logically this is all the same, great. And then what's gonna come from a response? It looks a lot alike, honestly. You get the first line looks like, oh, it, you get a response header, uh, and you get a protocol of like, yes, I acknowledged it. So you'll see 200 as okay, you'll get 300 class for redirects, 400 class for errors, 500 class for um, server-side errors. So 400 is client-side errors, 500 uh, is server-side errors. And then you'll get a whole bunch of headers. So what all these headers mean, they're in the spec. Um, but what you'll notice is I do have two in italics, so upgrade and connection. So this is an HTTP 1 request, 811 request. So what the server's coming back with, it says, hey, um, I speak HTTP 2, so if you want to make new requests to me, I'd be happy to talk that. Um, so it's an opportunity to upgrade to the next level protocol there. So, the other big thing to call out at the moment is HTTP 1, the request, response, all text. So what was really cool back in the old, 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 old days was I can tell net to a server, start typing all the live long day away, get my request, and then I can see my response. So if I would have said um, head, so I only want the headers coming back, I can just tell net in, tell net's available since like 1970 something. Um, and I can just, you know, easy debugging. The only debug tool I ever need anywhere is Telnet, and Telnet was always available anywhere. Yahoo. The downside is it's all text. Yep. So the upgrade H2, H2C, that's, um, so that's the messaging um, to, and I don't know the actual specifics to those, but it's, that's really the cue for the web browser, is the web browser receives that back. Um, that says, hey, you can upgrade to the next, uh, you can upgrade to HTTP2, because um, I offer that as an option. I think that's what it is. Yeah, so I think, and I think it would be, you know, this is all client dependent, but it would, it would evaluate in the order of, so preferring first an HTTP connection over TLS and then following back to the HTTP. Yeah. Yeah. So it's my clarity when you were talking, I was thinking there might have been a negotiation going on. 
There is a way, I believe there is a way to upgrade right away. Um, you won't get the response, you just get a different header back. So you get a different response code back. Um, I'm gonna conjecture it's probably in the 100 level, but don't quote me on that. Uh, upgrade is a, so upgrade says the server's uh, making a request back to the client saying, um, so right now it's saying content length, because it's giving you a content length and a content type, it's actually just serving the request back. But if you wanna make another request after this is done with this open socket connection, um, you can upgrade the request to HTTP2. So uh, the one one defects, so mostly around performance. So as you saw, um, it's, so browser makes a request to the server, it's one connection. Um, so you're throttled with that one connection per request. Now keep alive is a nice thing because you don't have to renegotiate um, the, the socket connections. You can reuse that, but you're still chained one at a time going uh, through that. Uh, back a long time ago, browsers uh, had their own limits of either four connections, six, eight connections. I don't know what the limit is today. Um, but uh, what a, a browser can then make upwards of six connections to a single web server, or actually domain. Um, so you could actually theoretically get six different things coming down at the same time. Um, for various web pages on a first time load where you have like dozens of, you know, images, CSS, text, sprites, and all that stuff, six is still a pretty low number. Um, so back in the day, a long time ago, people would fix this problem by, I would have www.example.com and then images.example.com or image one, image two, image three, like different domains to fake the browser out um, to hopefully bypass those, those six count restrictions. Um, Keep Alive helped. Because everything was text, you have things like cookies. Cookies can be rather huge. Uh, and then the other big defect, not big, uh, the other defect was server-generated updates. So um, as you're getting chatbots, you're getting various things like that, um, sometimes uh, the more advanced use cases uh, is you would want the web server to say, hey, um, I have a change, let me push it to you. Um, there's no way to do that in HTTP 1. So, what does 2 do? First thing 2 does is it's a binary protocol. Um, so when I say binary protocol, um, it, it can, because it's binary, you can compress things down. You're not dealing with text characters. You can multiplex your connection. So a single TCP connection can now send back multiple responses at the same time. Um, so the good thing is you get multiple responses. You can get multiple responses at the same time over the same connection. That's good. The bad side was the people who were doing all that domain sharding, now that's an actual anti-pattern because you might actually open more connections. So, eh, live, live and learn. Uh, it'd be, well, it'd have to be the, to the same host name. Um, and then uh, the next thing you have is HPAC. So HPAC, uh, what is HPAC? There's a, a beautiful article there, but what HPAC is is, um, so as you saw those headers, um, some of those headers now through the HPAC, um, I forget of how it's defined. Um, I don't want to say definition or standard, but uh, through that, some of those headers can be compressed into one character, a magic number. So things that are very common, like date, cookie, set cookie, accept, all of those, instead of sending all of those individual characters, you can just send a number. And that number is you know, well defined. So right there you get a couple bytes saved and then the content uh, that comes along for the ride after it, like a cookie. So um, like I've seen requests now, uh, at least on our website and other websites, you know, you're sending like a w upwards of like maybe a dozen cookies back where your, cookies, your total cookie size could be like anywhere from 200 to 1,000 some bytes um, and then some. So now that can get compressed. So you get a huge savings and when you're looking at a website where you're having like 60 or 70 you know, images on a page, that adds up over time. Um, the last part is it gives you uh, something called ALPN, Application Layer Protocol Negotiation. Um, it, it's a fancy way of saying um, 
when you're doing the negotiation back and forth, in other words, the client and the server say hello uh, and start talking to one another and, and agreeing, they're doing it in less packets. So once again, uh, the Googles, the Microsofts, uh, the Facebooks of the world where that first byte speed is super important, those less packets is, is what is uh, really nice for them. So now we're gonna go take a, a backwards dive back into TCP. Um, so why? Because it would be important for the networking. So on the TCP side, let's, quick, let's first quick talk about um, when you get a connection. So ignoring HTTP, let's just say any TCP connection in general, whether it's mail, whether it's almost anything, you're gonna have your client and your server. So your client is gonna say, send a send packet to the server, so it's gonna start the connection, the server's gonna come back to the client to say, yes, I would happily connect with you, and then the client's gonna come back and say, yes, I got your acknowledgement. So, ping pong ping. So, before you've even done anything, so just to get the initial connection, ping pong ping, three different packets, you know, round trips back and forth there. Why is that important? Um, over a local area network right here, not too bad. Um, we used to be, uh, like at, when, uh, at Armstrong, we used to be more global at the time, so we had Australia websites, and um, we were, um, for lack of a better term, limited by the speed of light. So um, getting a packet the whole way around the world and coming back and going back and forth to negotiate that connection really added up. Our performance was really crappy down there. Um, content delivery networks help, but um, speed of light, you just can't fight it. So the less packets, the better. Um, so that's one, one challenge to TCP connectivity. Another challenge to TCP is, um, the awesome thing about TCP is from an application developer perspective, you don't have to worry about packets arriving out of order. So when I am typing on a keyboard or sending packets, if some of the packets come out of order, it's up to the kernel, the operating system, to rearrange those packets to get them into the right order. So if I say hello, I'm gonna get H-E-L-L-O if it came in each individual packet. Um, so that's the good news. The bad news is to do that, the server needs to send the appropriate packets uh, uh, acknowledgements back saying, yeah, I got that one, yeah, I got that one, yeah, I got that one. Um, so as you see, so even though I'm sending, even as a web server, I'm sending like 100 megabytes up and, and real fast, the client still needs to send a couple messages back. Even though they're acknowledgements, it still adds up. Going to Australia, long time. You gotta fight the speed of light. Another problem is when you're trying to ramp up. So back in the old, 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 old days where like a 10 megabit network uh, was like, you know, really super fast. Now that's kind of like, eh, that's pretty slow. Um, ramping up to use that full 10, 10 megabits, um, the server would just start sending packets faster and faster and faster. And then eventually it would get to such a speed where the client would say, whoa, too many, um, I'm, I'm gonna lose some packets and it'll start to send an error back and then that's how you throttle to slow things down. So in the old days, because the numbers of, of how fast your network was was not that big, to get to that max number, usually it's, it wasn't too bad. Now that we are up to gigabit speeds and all that, to ramp up to there takes a lot, could take a lot longer. Like I said, these are more Google, Facebook, Microsoft problems. Mere mortals like us, probably not that much of a problem, but it is a problem per se. So the goal is how fast can I send those packets out the door? Um, so all of that being said, with HTTP2, so now you have multiplex connections. So I have client, I have server. If I can have five things coming down that one connection at the same time, what happens when one of those packets goes bad? It's gotta get a resend. So all of a sudden, all five of those resources that we're downloading all of a sudden get horked at the same time. So when you have a low quality network, uh, or things like that, uh, HTTP, HTTP2 can actually perform pretty badly in some circumstances. Um, so like over a wireless network, that's actually the case some people have found. Um, so, and then I mentioned the, uh, the, the ramp up speed there. So, 
Back to the original slide. What's new in HTTP3? Quick TLS, all the things, HPAC and improved server push. So I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna skip quick real quick because I'm gonna hit that in the next couple slides. TLS, all the things, that's pretty straightforward. So in HTTP 1 and 2, and well, 1, 1 and 2, um, TLS was optional. So you can do things in clear text, you could do it not in clear text. I mean, you can do it uh, securely with an SSL certificate and all that good stuff, yay. But it was your option. With HTTP 3, mandatory. Uh, and they also come up with QPAC, which is a replacement for HPAC. In my reading of it, it just seemed like the same thing. Um, so the reason it's called QPAC, though, is because of the way the transport mechanism happens. You can actually get headers in a different order. Um, so because the headers are coming in a different order, the rules of HPAC kind of got broke a little bit, so they just came up with QPAC. Um, don't quote me on that, but honestly, that's, that's how I interpreted it there. And then improve server push. So let me jump back to HTTP2. HTTP2, um, as you have that connection from client to server, if it's left open, there, are, there is messaging mechanisms for a server to say in a response, um, hey, I also have this resource over here and I'm gonna send it to you. So where that comes in handy is, um, so where that will really come in handy is let's say you're trying to get someone's homepage and on that homepage you have a couple CSS files, a couple JS files uh, and some images. So those things that are like, you know, critical path, HTTP2 gives you the option to say, as you're downloading our homepage, Oh, by the way, um, here's all the other resources that you're going to need too. So don't worry about parsing the HTML. But when you get to that HTML, here's the assets that come with it. So like, like I said before, it gives you a quicker turnaround time to that first page load. Um, so with HTTP 3, they just did more improvements on that. Um, so now the fun part is quick. So the too long didn't read of quick is you have TCP, over UDP with the following improvements. So it's running in user space, not kernel space. That's, so user space is versus kernel space. So I remember back in my you know, college days, 20, 30 years ago, um, that used to be a big thing. Um, what's really nice is in user space uh, versus kernel space, user space, you know, bad things happen, you're not violating the kernel. Um, yeah, um, that's all I'm gonna touch on because there's so many other rabbit trails we can go on there. The faster handshake, which I'll talk about next, is uh, with quick, with that faster handshake, uh, in a few packets, you can get your connection, get your TLS negotiation, and boom, you're good to go. TLS 1.3 by default, and this last piece is that connection ID. So since we're going over UDP, and I'll talk about UDP versus TCP in a moment. With that connection ID, if that connection is broken, you can still kind of, uh, when I say connection, that TCP connection is broken, um, or that logical connection is broken, it'll still uh, restart up kind of nicely. So let me start all over re-saying that once more. So with TCP, remember, I say hello, I get a response back, I say hello again. And then that, that uh, connection stays open, uh, and, the TC and, and everything goes back and forth nicely. If you switch IP addresses, for example, you're on a mobile phone, that connection is going to get broken, gone, and you're, you're, out, you're, you're dead in the water. As I read it with Quick, because they're doing this connection oriented, uh, with this connection ID, you can switch IP addresses. It doesn't matter that that TCP connection is broken. And why is that TCP connection getting broken important? Well, if you had five things chained on that connection as you're downloading it, well, all five resources that you're downloading has to get re-downloaded. By using a connection ID, you can just restart where you left off. Not quite, so there's, because there's a sufficient lag time between the two, I'm more or less thinking uh, with the connection ID oriented is it's more like you're driving down Route 30 and you're getting um, tossed from cell tower to cell tower and for some reason that cell tower can't preserve that IP so it pops you on something else. That's probably more the normal use case. 
um, because you're, trans you're going from office to here, the latency there of, you might as well just use a pigeon um, at that point. And there's a pigeon, pro there's, there's actually an RFC out there for doing all of this with the pigeon protocol too. Uh, well, when you run stuff in user space, you don't, usually you're just limited to the application you're running on then. So if something gets compromised, um, then it's only that application and the permission set that application's running in, which can be compromised. If you have a compromise in the kernel, well, now you, you, you have the keys to the kingdom. Um, so there's, that's, that's the one user space versus kernel space. Uh, that kind of topic people kind of jump on a lot. Um, I wish this was a little bigger now in hindsight, but I'm going to repeat kind of what I said before. So handshake comparison. So plain old TCP, ping pong ping. So whether it's um, HTTP 1, HTTP 2, same thing. But when you add TLS to it, you have ping pong ping, then you have a TLS handshake. So with the TLS handshake, how does that work? So TLS, um, I mean, I'm surprised it's, it, it's even that small of a number of things because with TLS, you have to do things like, yes, I want to do TLS. Great, that's wonderful. What protocols do you use? I use this, uh, not, not protocols, but what algorithms and what ciphers do you use? Oh, I like this cipher. Okay, great, you can use this cipher. Now that we're gonna use this cipher, let me give you a magic number so you can solve a math problem. So then we can decide how we're gonna actually encrypt it. So there's a lot of back and forth hand uh, negotiations to actually encrypt the conversation. Um, I won't go into more into that, but um, because TLS has so many back and forths, like I said, when you're talking to Australia to set up a TLS conversation, a lot of work to do. As opposed to quick, at least as if this, if this is, is honest, um, with quick you get the handshake and then boom, you're off to the races. So that's a lot faster. So one thing I didn't talk about was what is UDP versus TCP? So TCP, it's connection oriented. It's TCP, you, I send a request, I send a packet of data. When you get that packet of data, eventually the, um, the, the other side will send a, pack, a tiny packet back saying, yep, got it. With UDP, it's all connectionless. It's really more like going to the town square or something like that and saying, hi, here's my stuff, and that's about it. So with UDP, it, it, and that's kind of overstating it, but UDP is more like, I'm gonna send you some packets, and if you get them, that's cool. If you don't get them, yeah, that's fine too. So the downside of that then is with UDP is uh, you have to also create a mechanism that you can get the error correction coming back. So what I said back in the first slide was they, what Google and, and the other folks uh, who came up with Quick essentially did was they reinvented TCP. They just did it on top of UDP. Um, so what are the downsides? So right now UDP is not as optimized because everyone's been not using UDP for the longest time. Honestly, back in the day a long, 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 long time ago where we used UDP uh, mainly was for multiplexing. So it was great for like if I'm on a local area network right here um, and I want to stream something to everyone at the same time, UDP is perfect because if you get the packets, great, I don't care. Um, I'm just going to send them to all and, and then it's very consistent. Um, because UDP is not used very much, um, people don't know how to network manage it very well. So it could be throttled for various reasons um, and, and other traffic shaping, who knows what will happen to it. While, UDP, while it's an RFC, um, the libraries that support QUIC, there's not many. In fact, yesterday um, I actually went to look at curl um, to see what the state of curl was and curl's support for um, HTTP 3 is still labeled as experimental. You literally still have to build it, and when you go to build it, it looks like they give you an option of three different libraries um, to, to build it with. So until curl comes out with a client representation of it, um, us mere mortals uh, probably won't be using HTTP 3 too much yet. Um, is the performance worth the complexity? Um, 
Maybe. Um, like I said, uh, the people who came up with this was Google. Um, so before Quick, this used to be called Spidey. Um, and then Spidey went away um, and got relabeled Quick and then relabeled HTTP3. Um, so really, who's, who's driving this? It's really the Googles of the world, the Microsofts of the world, the folks that absolutely run at such scale that every byte counts and every packet um, ca uh, counts um, for those guys. Um, for me, um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm st I still work on the marketing website, but I have a content delivery network in front of me running HTTP2, and we try to cache things. Um, most of the performance stuff that I see doesn't really mean too much. For me, I, I work with marketing all day, and my biggest bang for the buck for performance is trying to convince them not to put um, 13 different beacons on the, onto a single web page from 17 different vendors. Um, if, I can get, if I can not have that happen, then I'd worry about this a lot more. That, we can talk about that after the thing. Um, it'll be an IT security nightmare. Um, so uh, right now, IT security, like you know, if they want to do t deep pack, packet inspection for various things, run man in the middle, uh, or things like that. So from an enterprise IT security or, or various things like that, uh, how do you manage it? It's, it's so one of the interesting sides of HTTP three could be who knows. Uh, who might set up websites that are more nefarious and go under the radar a lot longer because we don't have the mechanisms to detect that they are nefarious websites. Um, so in a predictable network, um, like a data center or something like that, HTTP2, in my opinion, is probably good enough. Um, and then lastly, uh, one of the things is proxy servers. So we don't have HTTP2 to HTTP3 proxy servers um, because the protocol is totally different. Uh, so how do you use a proxy server? So in enterprise settings and lots of other settings, um, we're going to have a lot of challenges there. Mm -hmm. uh, no, the Facebooks and no, the Facebooks and Googles of the world. Um, well, they have two different goals. So. Facebook's goal is really just to keep you glued to their, to their timeline and get engagement because you're the product. So they don't really have any interest in security. Um, and they, they have a long history of that. Now, there's different lenses on how I can say that in jest. Um, the Googles of the world, um, they're just really trying to make sure that advertisement gets in front of you. Um, so their security front would be more like, uh, kind of what they're already doing today. Um, so personally, yeah, that's. So no, no network Say again? Network unreliability. Network unreliability. Um, yeah, so where I see this really shining um, is really in the mobile world or the Internet of Things world. At least that's what the article said. So in the mobile world, it really makes sense right away. So if I'm driving and I have a kid in the back seat um, and he's streaming YouTube and, he's and I'm driving down the highway getting tossed from cell tower to cell tower to cell tower, HTTP3 is going to probably be really good for keeping that stream um, active for him so he doesn't get the lag and I get the, the whining or something like that uh, because there's the lag. Um, so on that side, it's going to be great. Um, on the Internet of Things side, it kind of remains to be seen it, like in a... Um, as we see more Internet of Things devices pop up, you know, if they're static, is their connection going to be solid? That, that's what I don't know. But if there's a lot of them and weird weather conditions, who knows uh, how that will operate. Um, and then last, um, I tried to put links to everything I, I, I referenced before. Um, I'll put this uh, slide out, th this whole slideshow out somewhere. Um, not sure where yet. I'll post it in Tech Lancaster. Um, I have it on my website. Um, that's not an easy thing to get to, um, at least on here. Um, but yeah, those links were really great uh, to kind of give you a quick uh, deep dive uh, on, on, these, on these topics here. But really, in a nutshell, HTTP2 was network performance, HTTP3 network performance again, except it just rewrote the whole protocol. Um, and then the last thing is quick is pretty generic. so. What's really interesting is once they perfect the HTTP3 thing uh, with Quick, 
there is opportunity to use that as a generic protocol um, to actually do new things in the future that are not HTTP related. What are those things? I don't know, but once they have the libraries out there, it'd be kind of fascinating to see uh, what people do with it. Um, so that, I'm all done now. I'm sorry it went a little long, but. I'm sorry, I didn't. Yeah, so the question was, how does TLS work over UDP? So there is the initial, I, my impression was the initial handshake over gives you, they've changed the handshake that they gave you a lot more information to kind of say, what, also you're dealing with TLS 1.3, um, so what, personally I don't know the differences in TLS 1.3, 2, and 1, the TLSs that is, um, but I'm sure because they're trying to network optimize Every time they've gone through the spec, they've been trying to figure out ways of how they how can they shorten the life cycle. So, are they restricting ciphers? Are they restricting um, other things that I can't really answer that one? I wish I could. What's the actual implementation of this? So, does every website need to upgrade to HTTP three? Is that like how does what are the steps to getting to there? Good question. Um, so the question was, how do you, how do we get to HTTP three? So the good news is, browsers are already because it's Chrome and Microsoft is using Edge, uh, using Chromium and all that. Browsers are pretty good, pretty good to go. Um, so on the web server side, we're still seeing um, the the adoption's not there yet. Um, so you'll see adoption based on things like Google. Um, I don't even see it in the content delivery network space yet. Um, like. Like I, I've seen, like I, I use Akamai, and HTTP, HTTP2 felt like it took a while for that to even roll out. Um, so for that, for uh, content delivery networks to move over to HTTP3, that's going to be a long time in passing. Um, as for individual web servers, um, so um, I belong to the, I'm uh, one of the Apache Tomcat committers, so I kind of know the inside scoop there. Um, that's not even on our radar at the moment. Um, it, like, it's kind of on the radar, but because of the UDP issues of trying to figure out how to do this in UDP, because it's such a total rewrite, um, that's like, it's just an amazing, uh, it's gonna be a Herculean effort for a lot of the individual web server folks to kind of do that. So unless there's a major stream platform like the example you gave with the car, is there any reason like the average website is not trained over there? Yeah, I don't see, and that's that's it. I don't see much much compelling reason at, at the current time to go over to HTTP three. If you're on a, if you haven't gone to HTTP two, then definitely go there. Um, you're gonna gain a whole bunch. Getting HTTP three, unless you're doing like next gen things or things that are doing that are very server push oriented, or your client base is in a in a mobile world um, that's like truly mobile and you know they're traveling and things like that. I'm not really overly compelled. So while I think HTTP three is cool, that's it. It's cool. Am I going to go to it? Nah. Probably. It, it, so I, I don't see a reason to kind of go to it for a while. These are the kind of things that like, I would just imagine HTTP four coming along, and before anybody's even on HTTP three, or is just so much more impressive than HTTP two. Do you see that kind of thing happening here, where the incremental change between two and three doesn't seem to be that dramatic? In the future that's well, so the question was, um, like, would we go to an HTTP four um, before we get to a three? I mean, yeah, I. The only reason I would, yeah, I, if the adoption rate is so abysmal, so it's because it's so complex, and they come out with an HTTP four, I don't even know what that would look like, honestly. Um, so I, I don't even. I would think probably what would happen is they would probably add new revisions to HTTP2 to clean up some of the multiplexing issues. Uh, or, yeah, that would probably be what they do is they probably do a combination. They, they would probably send the right hints back to the client, excuse me, um, to say, hey, should you be in multiplex mode or should you be in uh, individual connection mode? And maybe they start uh, upping the limits that um, you can have you can have like you know 50 connections from a single client to a server um, because honestly, uh, 
oh, what were the articles? Like, this is even like, even five to 10 years ago, you can actually have like a single web server, like be, have like almost a million connections at the same time. Um, now, when I say a million connections at the same time, it's probably more like a chat bot or something like that, but the networking stacks have become so solid and advanced that you can have so many connections at the same time and then bandwidth is so huge that really you're probably just running into probably more memory issues. Um, but if you have the nice I.O. and you can bypass the, you know, the memory, then you know, a single server can really push out a whole lot, either in one one or in two. Yep. Um, yeah, uh, I think that's, I think we're out on time there. But thank you very much.